So, now that I've presented the background, here is a thumbnail sketch. What is Gaza? So here it goes. Gaza is 25 miles long. It's five miles wide. To put that in some sort of perspective for myself, it's the distance, the width of Gaza is the distance I jog every morning along Coney Island Seashore. Coney Island Seashore is 2.5 miles. I do a round trip. Gaza's width is my jogging distance in the morning. Gaza's length is less than a marathon. A marathon is 26.2 miles. Gaza's length is about 25 miles. That's Gaza. Gaza is inhabited by 2.1 million people. Of those 2.1 million people, 70%, as I've already said, are refugees or descendants of refugees. Half of Gaza it comprises children. So I assume there's nobody in this room, probably almost nobody in the room, uh, that's under 18 years of age. So when you think of Gaza, you should think of everybody, half of Gaza, one half of Gaza is younger than anybody in the room listening to my presentation now. They're children. Gaza is children. Half. Gaza is among the most densely populated places on God's earth. It's more densely populated than Tokyo. So when you hear Israel saying it wants to empty out the northern sector, your imagination should conjure the image of among the most densely populated places on earth now becoming twice as densely populated. Gaza has been, well, let's start before I get to the economic situation. Nobody can go into Gaza. Nobody can get out of Gaza with the rarest exceptions. Nobody goes in, nobody goes out. You have a medical condition, very difficult to get out. If you don't have a medical condition, you're not getting out. As I said, even if you do, very, very difficult. But if you don't, you're not leaving Gaza. So, uh, and also, uh, economically, 50% of Gaza is unemployed. Among youth, it's 60% are unemployed. So basically, you have a population. Oh, and also, I should mention, uh, under humanitarian organizations have described Gaza as being uh, the half the population as being suffering from severe food insecurity. Severe food insecurity, which is to say about half of Gaza suffers not from the starvation, but suffers from hunger, daily hunger. So now, if you put all the pieces together, you have a blockade that's lasted now for about two decades. Nobody goes in. Nobody goes out, with the rarest of exceptions. Half the population is unemployed. Among youth, it's 60%. Half of the population is chronically suffering from hunger. When you add all those pieces together, it doesn't come all together as a surprise that the conservative prime minister of the UK David Cameron described Gaza as, quote, an open-air prison. Now, one of Israel's most eminent sociologists, Baruch Kimberling, at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, he since passed, but he described Gaza as, quote, the largest concentration camp ever. So, somewhere between open air prison, one pole of the spectrum, and largest concentration camp ever, that's Gaza. 
The young men who burst through the gates of Gaza on October 7th, probably, almost certainly, that was the first time they had ever breathed free air. They were born into a concentration camp, if you use Baruch Kim, Professor Kimmerling's terminology, or they were born into a prison. That, I think, is the essential background for trying to understand the unfolding of events since October 7th. And at this point, I'm going to stop talking and I will field questions either on the history as I described it and or um, if you want points of clarification to trying to understand what, what has happened since October 7th or you might want to hear my judgments on what happened since October 7th. How do I, so to speak, morally arbitrate? I will also be happy to discuss the legal side of the question, but there are, there are obviously three dimensions beginning October 7th. The first dimension is the factual side what happened. And some aspects, some aspects of it remain murky, but the general picture I think is more or less clear. I don't think there are going to be any, there will be more precision in detail, but I don't think there will be any great revelations. Then there is the legal side. What does Israel have the right to do under international law, and what doesn't it have the right to do? And then there is the moral side. And as you all know, uh, law often lags behind morality. Uh, and so the moral dimension is not synonymous with the legal dimension. And I'm happy to uh, entertain to hear you out on any of those three dimensions of what's happened since October 7th or if you want to challenge my history, I'm perfectly happy to hear you out. Okay, so now let's begin with the questions and hopefully uh, you can organize yourselves, form a line, and uh, query me.